Want to find out what's going on in your community? El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Go to your local newsstand and pick up your free copy today. Looking for the training and skills you need to get a new career? Call Center for Training and Careers today. That's CTC at 408-213-0961 and start building your new career today. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. We have a great show for you ahead. I have a few announcements. I wanted to remind you of the ARP campaign. I've been telling you about that every week. And that's the Divided We Fail campaign. And it's really important to join the Divided We Fail movement because what it does, it gives us a voice. And by doing so, you're pledging to vote for candidates who will ensure that all Americans have access to affordable health care. And that's so important to us as indigenous people. And to vote for candidates who we know will be looking out for our best interests and who actually have a plan for us and not just rhetoric. So it's important to go on to aarp.org and support the Divided We Fail campaign. So don't forget, we have to stick, stick together on that. Uh, another thing that's coming up in the community, we know the holidays are coming up and you're gonna be doing a lot of shopping for the holidays. So the Native TANF program, which is one of the sponsors for Native Voice TV, it's located on First and Empire in San Jose. They are having a holiday boutique. And you know, a lot of times you wait for the powwows to go buy your gifts, but this is a good time to buy them during the off season when there's no powwows going on. But you can get native gifts um, made by indigenous people. And that'll be on December 5th. Uh, let's see, December 5th through the 8th. So it's for a few days from 1 to 5 p.m. So stop by. First in Empire, that's the Native TANF offices, and you can call there, ask for Kelly at 280-2280 if you want more information, but uh, I'm going to go over there first day, so you better try and beat me there so you can get the good stuff. <laughs> but go by, there'll be a lot of nice little gifts there that you can have for the holidays. And the other thing I wanted to remind you of is um, our good friend and a, a, a wonderful man, Floyd Red Crow Westerman, has been very, very ill. And so we're asking all of you to burn sage, send your prayers to him because um, I guess he's had a relapse of his cancer. I'm not really sure what's wrong, but I know he's been in a coma and that he's had people around him singing for him, praying for him. And it's important that all of us throughout the country, throughout the nation, pray for him as well. So keep him in your prayers, please. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our guests for today. I happen to have the pleasure of meeting them and I believe it was the West Valley Pow Wow. And I'd like to welcome Anita, let's see if I can say this correctly. And Richard Gonzalez, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And you are of the Lipan Apache, Apache Band of Texas. Yes. Why don't you explain that? Because I probably said it all wrong. No, you, you, you said it. There's really no wrong way of saying those things. Uh, we have a lot of people here in California, but almost half of our uh, Lipan Apache uh, members live within a 100, 100 mile radius of Fresno. Oh, and that's why we're I here. We have, that. Yes, uh, our uh, administrative offices are in Edinburgh, Texas. Uh -huh. However, because so many of our uh, People have migrated over here after World War II. We have so many people, and we've, we're starting to actually get together. We've, uh, we've known about each other and know we kind of live within the communities mm -hmm. around here. But we're starting to really come together now and uh, at functions and just in, in, as a community should. Well, that's wonderful. So it's the, your group is active not only in Texas, but in the Fresno and Bay Area, I guess, huh? Yes. Um, 
I actually worked here in San Jose for 26 years. You were uh, a police officer. I was a police officer here in, in uh, San Jose, and I, uh, I'm retired now. So I retired in, in 03. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of time now to devote to this, this history of, uh, it's, that's incredible about our family's histories. And, uh, and, and pass it on to a lot of those others that, that are just now learning about it or maybe just known just very little bit, just on the surface over time. But uh, there's so much, uh, it, and it's all our history. It's our country's history, too. And uh, we uh, pass it on not only to us, our families, but to those communities that we live in, because this is where we live. That's important, especially when you look at the, the holidays and the holidays that they're actually celebrating. They should really know what they're celebrating. And how people sacrificed. Yes, it is. And we, uh, in, in, the, in the few years now that I've been retired, and even before then, I started doing a lot more research. <clears throat> Others have done much more than I have. Uh, so a lot of it is <clears throat> credit to them, you know, of, of their persistence and to, uh, to keep digging and not give up. And every little bit really uh, adds more pieces to the puzzle. So uh, things really start coming to light as, uh, as more pieces come uh, together. Now, you're um, both educators? We're both retired. And, uh, <laughs> yes. But you're educating now again. <laughs> yes. I'm retired from the police uh, department here, and, uh -huh. and Anita retired from the University of Texas. Pan American uh, in Edinburgh, Texas. Mm -hmm. I was a secretary for political science, uh, uh -huh. education department, uh, health sciences, so I've been around uh, educators mm -hmm. for quite some time. And you're both educating our people yes. and our children. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Uh, well, that we've taken, was kind of goes with uh, actually doing this and we're not really doing mm -hmm. it for ourselves um, uh, when I first started uh, I just wanted to learn because I knew very little I knew some but not not very much to not enough to be to feel confident in my own self mm -hmm. let alone talking about it uh, but in time uh, we have really dug a lot and, f and as the more you find it really it really it's almost like an explosion of of education we've uh, We've taken on the duty now and the responsibility to pass it on to not just our people in Texas, but here in California and in all parts between. We, Let me uh, ask you a, ba a basic question. Now, most people have heard of the Apache tribe, but there's different bands. Explain the different bands and how they differ. Well, with, within each region, uh, over time, uh, it's like families. And in time, you know, people marry and move. Uh, migrate, different things of that sort, and the Lipan Apache have um, lived in that southwest Texas area for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, so a lot of the history is there, and over time, when the uh, Europeans came to settle uh, the Americas, mm -hmm. uh, to some degree that caused some uh, uh, conflict. Uh, and I started putting this, the pieces to the puzzle together for my own self. Uh, because I was trying to figure out how my parents, my grandparents, how they actually met each other. And, and, and it really wasn't really making a whole lot of sense still until I, I, I researched the history of that region a lot more closely and then in, in, in a way just kind of overlapped it. Mm -hmm. And then it became more clear of how they met and why they moved, uh, when they moved in, in uh, when you look at time. Can you share that with us? Yes, I, I, in, in order to share that better uh, and, and to put a picture on, 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 on these faces, which really had an impact for me, because when I started doing this research, I read a large uh, article, a lot of history about Texas area region, uh, and it, not until I saw my grandmother's name did it actually take on a new meaning, because now that history, that, that uh, Apache history, became my history, because now my grandmother's name's in this, in this uh, uh, history. So uh, it, with that in mind, then I started going further than that and, and taking it further back, because obviously if, if she has that history, uh, I, I knew a little bit, a few things, but not, not, I didn't think I knew as much as I probably should have. Mm -hmm. why, why wasn't it that I, that I knew as much as uh, most people, a lot of people know a lot about their, their mm -hmm. history, genealogy, and I knew about genealogy, a history of where I descended from, but not who those people were and what their customs were. And probably so, because you were forced, or most tribes were forced to hide and, that and history. And especially in Apaches. Mm. Uh, behind me is a, is a picture, uh, or actually, it's a, I, I, paint, I painted it, 
It's, uh, I got it uh, from a rendering of a pencil drawing mm -hmm. out of history books in Texas. That's Cuelgas uh, Castro. Yeah. He's my great, great, great grandfather. Uh, he was a, an Ap Lipan Apache chief. He signed, uh, I believe it was three treaties mm -hmm. with the uh, United States, uh, the Texas uh, Republic, and the Mexican government uh, in his lifetime. His yeah. son, uh, which is, I, I also uh, rendered it my own uh, way, uh, is uh, Juan Castro. And that's where the history starts uh, really uh, making, not making sense, but changing a little bit because the, he was, he, he was uh, one of the chief or war captains of the Lee Pan Apache in Texas in the uh, mid-1800s when the, a lot of the, uh, when Texas became a state, when Mexico became a, a, a Mexico in 1821, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things were happening in, the, in that region. And so what happened was he was, hap his lifetime was in the middle of all this turmoil mm -hmm. uh, for the Apaches. Uh, when Cuelgas was alive, his father, uh, he was actually uh, at the end of his life actually given a, a promotion to a general of the Texas Rangers uh, by uh, Sam Houston. Uh, a lot of the family, because uh, a lot of the leadership roles, you know, kept within the families or immediate community that learned those leadership roles, especially within the Apaches. Uh, so uh, that was passed on in part to his son, Juan Castro. Being friends with the Texas Rangers, the U.S. Cavalry, the, uh, whoever would help the Apache. And that's what the Apaches uh, first, first uh, they, they, they value your freedom. So if somebody had an impact or uh, really was a threat to the freedom, they would seek out other friends mm -hmm. to help them protect that freedom, in essence. Uh, so for a time, they were friends with the Texas Rangers and the, and the U.S. government, the Mexican government. But then as, as uh, uh, the territories and the settlers started taking the land, uh, killing the buffalo, in and those kind of things, then the, the, the political situations, the climate really changed a lot in the mid-1800s. And into the middle 1800s, uh, uh, the, in essence, the Indian Wars here in this country took place and started, uh, and a lot of it having to do with the Apaches along the southwest there. Not only the Lipan, but also Shirakawa, the Mescalero, Hikarias, all those, and Navajos, all those, and, and Sioux all the way up in the plains, all throughout the plains, all those uh, Indian tribes throughout the plains. Uh, the Indian Removal Act the United States had passed in the 1830s uh, forced a lot of the Indian, or most of the Indian tribes east of the United States, west of the Mississippi, into the Oklahoma Territory at the time, which created conflict because that pushed the Comanches into traditional Lipan Apache tribal lands. So it created problems there. Uh, and a lot of those things had influences over the Lipans and how they migrated. Uh, a lot of the buffalo that was, uh, th that migrated through the plains there uh, were uh, completely uh, annihilated in the 1860s, which ended a lot of the food supply for the Lipan Apache. Uh, and by the 1873, my great grandmother was eight years old and also uh, have, uh, this is her here. This is my great-grandmother, Juanita Castro, her husband. This is my grandmother and this is my mother. Uh, uh -huh. and my, my parents and then my grandparents and my great-grandparents. I have stories when she was eight years old. Uh, in 1873, uh, in all this research, there's, there's some books here from Fort Clark. This is in Texas, Fort Clark, the Texas Rangers, and Crossing the Border with the Fourth Cavalry. And these stories in these books, these are just a couple of the books. You I have so Maybe many. I, need to hold the book. Book. I have so, uh, so many other books that are more detailed. In one particular raid uh, that it refers to is McKinsey's raid. And Colonel McKinsey was a, a popular. Um, young military, U.S. cavalry soldier, similar to Custer, uh, Indian fighter, uh, really respected amongst the cavalry. Uh, General Sheridan was ordered by President Grant to attack the Apache, who by 1873, a lot of them had migrated into Mexico in a place called Remolino. 
Uh, it's a Lipan village in uh, 40 miles uh, west of uh, about Eagle Pass, Texas, mm -hmm. which is an area where Fort Clark is. The raid, the raid was launched at day, daybreak. It was a surprise raid on the Lipan village uh, and also the Kickapoo village, Potawatomi village. Uh, they were there for, to protect each other. At uh, dawn, th th they launched a raid, and, and, th and in particular that day because uh, Colonel McKenzie had had scouts report to him that most of the Lipan uh, Apache men had been out on a, uh, a hunting party that the day before. So he, he figured it wouldn't be much of a battle because it was mostly older, older men and, and, and younger children and women in camp. And he was correct. They launched the raid, and they, uh, their orders were to annihilate and completely destroy the villages, which they did uh, in mostly. They, they did take 40 prisoners, 29 of them were uh, Lipan Apaches. My great-grandmother was eight years old at the time, and her brother, uh, Calixtro, was 14. Uh, and mind you, she's eight years old, and at eight years old, uh, she was waking up at dawn with all this shooting going on, uh, uh, screaming, uh, a lot of confusion, horses running all over the place. So she took her 18-month-old uh, little brother and went and hid in, in, a, in a hole and pulled a bush over themselves to, con uh, to conceal themselves. Mm -hmm. And mind you, she's eight years old, wow. and an eight-year-old knew what to do. So obviously this wasn't the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, she did that, and as, as the battle or as this raid uh, took place, they burned everything, took the horses that, they, they, that were there in the, in the camps and the prisoners, and they put them on horses and forced them uh, back to the United States border. Uh, before the raid ended, the noise was dying down, I'm assuming, and her little baby brother started crying. So a U.S. Cavalry soldier heard the crying and came to the bush and stabbed the bush with a saber, killing uh, her 18-month-old baby br uh, brother in her arms. So my respect for her has grown just immensely. Uh, had it been any other eight-year-old, mm -hmm. would have lost it and started screaming herself. Yeah. But she kept her uh, composure and, and, and uh, wow. was able to survive. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, after that, the soldiers left and uh, hearing the baby uh, stop crying. And uh, she waited there until she heard the voice of her uh, older brother, Calixtro, calling her and asking for her families. Uh, I believe her mom was killed on that raid and, and there was uh, a lot of confusion, a lot of prisoners were taken. Uh, so after her brother came out, she came out from her uh, uh, place where she, she was hiding and they both walked uh, to San Juan, Texas, which is in South Texas, about 325 miles away. Uh, about a month later, their, uh, their father uh, the fellow here on a, on a horse, shows up. His name at the time was Juan Castro. He uh, changed his name to Porfirio Castro, which uh, at that time there was a president of Mexico, was Porfirio. And he, he was obviously elated that, uh, that he had children that were actually had lived through this battle or this raid. Wow, it wasn't a battle. Amazing. Uh, it, was a, it was a massacre it is was. what it really was. Uh, so he made them promise never again to speak Apache or uh, to participate in any customs. Uh -huh. they, uh, they lived the rest of their lives that way. And uh, so when people ask me, hey, how come you never told me you're Apache? Or how come you didn't dress up like Apache? You know, today I dress like an Apache, not for myself, but for them, to honor them. I could understand that. Wow, you know, and my grandmother, my great-grandmother from the age of eight, of course, the rest of her life, never again admitted she was Apache. Uh, I've had my own lot. relatives uh, become upset that we would even say we're Apaches. Or how, how dare I say we're Apaches, mm -hmm. uh, savages, you know, uh, godless savages. But that's not, that's not true. I mean, uh, the more I've, I've, I've researched, the more I've come to understand that the Creator is what they've always worshipped, is that what other Creator is there? Uh, Very it's just rich that, heritage. But anyway, so that's what got me started. Wow. And, and, then, and then it just, of course, has gone from this. So every time I run across a blockade or somebody who gives me a hard time, I, I just 
I can't help to think to myself uh, and, and think back to my great-grandmother. I mean, I've had people say uh, things to me in the middle of a parade, and uh, you know, if I had time, I would tell them the story of my great-grandmother and what, what, what that means to me. So what, any hard time that somebody could give me is absolutely nothing, nothing that, like, to what she's endured. Compared to what she went through. Uh, tell us a little bit about the regalia you're both wearing. Uh, uh, there's another thing we've done is try to keep everything uh, traditional and original. We've made everything. We have bought nothing. Uh, uh, the beads here are, are commonly referred to as warrior beads. They're, uh, some people call them mezcal. They actually come from the Texas mountain laurel tree. They're a poisonous bead actually, but they use, because they're such a hard bead, uh, they get such a really hard shell, uh, they, we use them. I know a lot of people nowadays use them, uh, especially for gore dancing, mm -hmm. which is a cleansing dance before powwows. Uh, we uh, use them, Lipan Apache, uh, leaders uh, in, or people in leadership position wear the yellow ones you see here. Uh, I have some yellow Tell us about what you're wearing, Anita. Well, this is the logo for Lipan Apache and uh, the yellow mountain laurels. They're very rare and uh, we're known that only the leaders wear them. And I'm um, an enrollment officer. I've been helping out Lipan Apache uh, for quite some time. and. Uh, I'm the low-key person that does paperwork and things like that. And, uh, and what's the significance of the headband? Apache women wore the, the, either the yellow or the green band, and uh, men wore the red bands. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it signified Apaches, Apache women, because in, in Texas it's a very hot and humid uh, climate. So uh, they would wear them, especially for their sweat around their their head and also uh, s uh, showing the other tribes that would come across that there were uh, a band within themselves, that they were separated. They would tell each other uh, by what they wore, what kind of a band they were. Uh, because uh, the Kickapoo uh, is a band also that came up from up north that landed in Texas mm -hmm. uh, across Eagle, uh, an Eagle Pass. And they were, at the same time that the Liban went through the raid in 1873, they were there also. So uh, different tribes <coughs> showed that they were from that specific tribe by what they wore and the colors they wore. Lipan wore very often green. I see. Green. I think when I spoke to you before, you were talking about the significance of long sleeves or short sleeves or the dresses. Yes. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Women, I'm not wearing the dress at the moment, mm -hmm. but the women wore the long sleeve, the older women. The young women would wear the short sleeve. And they wore camp dresses that I'll wear one of these days <laughs> in your show. It's a, a, a dress that's gathered all the way around. It's nothing glamorous, but when I wear it, I'm proud because that's what my uh, parents' uh, parents wore. Mm -hmm. And my mom often uh, talks about how her grandmother would take off on a horse with her long camp dress, and they like dark colors mm -hmm. also. I, I give you another example of um, the camp dresses. Uh, I don't have the picture with me, but uh, in, uh, well, it was 1962, my, uh, my grandmother, we were living in Pinedale, which is north side of Fresno, a uh, small community. And uh, my uh, grandmother's uh, side of the family had been, because they always gathered at my grandmother's house, because she was pretty much the matriarch of the family in, in the Fresno region, and people would gather there. And one particular day, the subject about uh, 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 where you came from had come up, and, uh, and my grandmother said that we were Apaches. My, her mom, Juanita Castro, was Apache, and then one of her uh, uh, sisters, which is my, my mom's aunts, my grand aunts, had taken offense to that. And, and, and they'd, the argument, it, it was essentially an argument, and it got heated. And my grandmother pointed to the street and says, you can be whatever you want out there in the street. Here, you're an Apache. Within a few weeks, my grandmother had, had bought some material and sewn together and a camp dress and asked my mom to come to the house and we took the picture there with my mom, I still have the picture at home, uh, and said this is what her mom used to wear proudly. This is what she wore, take the picture of it so everybody can see. Oh, and, uh, and, and I believe for, for us at the time, even though the subject had come up about our, our uh, 
ancestors, but it really hadn't been reinforced. Didn't have a lot other than just mentioning who we, where we came from. Uh, but customs uh, really didn't participate in anything that we knew of. In time, uh, we uh, we found out that we actually were, but we just we just assumed, oh, this was just part of uh, the Texas uh, culture that we w things that we ate, and uh, which brings me to another subject. We uh, earlier this or last year we we were we just finished a, a grant on on reintroduction of, of traditional foods to our people. And a lot of those foods, uh, we just considered, oh, they're just Texas foods uh, because uh, stuff that, that kind of stuff grows in the deserts, uh, nopales. Uh, a, a lot of the traditional foods, and those are Apache foods uh, because that's I'm what I'm not our, surprised. Uh, and, and, a lot, and there's a lot of other foods. We, have, we actually made a whole cookbook uh, included in there, a lot of the nutritional oh, really? values of uh, stuff like that, pictures of our elders cooking the foods, uh -huh. uh, where those foods came from. Uh, uh, drying of, of the, a lot of the meats, like jerky, uh, and essentially uh, th those were traditionally what w our ancestors ate. And so that, that we just finished that up, and of course, even w I say we finished it, we just hit the, the the tip of the iceberg because there's so much more that that we have. We could we could have made volumes of books, but uh, that Is was that a really book that you're publishing. We, we're, okay. we're planning on publishing. We just finished it, okay. so we need to get it together, we'll and, and we'll, to we'll have one. it finished here we'll probably within a month or so. Uh, it's it's a lot really time consuming. We went and recorded a lot of our elders, and so it started out as cooking. We ended up in a lot of different directions because a lot of them had some really heart wrenching stories about when they were young, and so we just picked that up and recorded a lot of them. About, we're over 30 of them now that, that had a lot of stories. Some of them, a lot of them, it was the first time they've ever even spoken well, about Well, you things. promised to come on next week's show and tell me all about that because I think we just touched the tip of the iceberg. I wanted to find out about the flags and all these articles you brought. So if you promise to come back next week, I think they'll be back, right? Sure. sure. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week on Native Voice TV.